Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today on this uh, lovely, slightly more chilly Thursday for what is our final Learn United engagement series uh, panel of the season. Um, it's been a great virtual campaign. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your support. And uh, we promise that today's discussion is going to be just as robust as the previous ones that uh, you may or may not have been uh, part of this fall. It's been a very exciting uh, campaign. So this is, um, this is going to be our final one of the season and no doubt a very interesting one. Today's topic, uh, we're going to be tackling issues of housing and homelessness. Um, in Columbus, a uh, person would have to make $19.83 an hour to afford a two-bedroom home at the fair market rate of just a little over $1,000 a month, which that's always seems to be changing and going up very quick. But the average renter in our community falls short of that number, making just about $16.99, almost $17 an hour. And affordable housing, as we all know, is in very short supply in Central Ohio. Uh, but United Way and other organizations, um, like the organizations we are joined with today, are committed to ensuring families have access to safe and affordable housing. We are all doing our best, and we are joined today by three panelists that have channeled their passion for addressing our community's challenges of housing and homelessness. Uh, first, we have Sonia Todd with the YWCA. She is the director of the YWCA Family Center. Thank you, Sonia. We have Carly Booz, the executive director of our community's Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. And finally, we have Mark Easterling, a HUD certified housing counselor with Homes on the Hill CDC. Thank you all. Uh, for joining us today. And today's panel is going to be moderated by Erin Prosser. Erin Prosser is with the City of Columbus. She is our Assistant Director of Housing Strategies. Um, thank you all once again. And um, we are pleased to have you as our Learning United experts on this issue. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Erin. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. And then, uh, I want to thank United Way for putting this panel together. And uh, I'm very excited to speak with um, our panelists and learn a little bit more about the work they're doing and, and where we are in Columbus in, in terms of housing. Um, I'm going to start today um, with Ms. Todd and talking about the work that the YWCA is doing. Um, I'm going to have you just kind of talk about your work a little bit, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions, if, if that's all right. Well, Erin, I would like to say thank you for having me on the panel. Um, the YWCA Columbus is committed to uh, serving the community. Um, we are a 50 room facility, private room facility. Um, we serve families. So you have to be a family in order to enter our shelter. Uh, we are, I like to think that our shelter is holistic as far as services and delivery. Um, so we build programming around our families to help them be successful um, to their next best housing goal. So we have the programs that are financial for financial literacy. Um, we have a, our on-site ERC where that's our employment resource center um, where we have computers so that our families have access to computers. I'm proud to announce that we have a five-star step up to quality, uh, safe and sound child care center um, that's attached to our program that our parents can use. You know, when services are on site, they're easily accessible and it's uh, healthier for parents to be able to do that. We have on-site mental health services through Eastway. Um, transition into shelter is difficult. Um, when you walk in and, and you're homeless and, and you need help, you, you need that stability. You need those things to wrap yourselves in. Um, we have uh, just programs that are gonna help our families um, get to their next best housing options. Sonia, I know the, the folks that you serve and have been serving, you know, before the pandemic, there was pressure on your folks and certainly the pandemic uh, exacerbated some of the pressures that your families were facing. What were the things that really um, came to light during the pandemic that really um, were, were part of the issues you guys were dealing with specific to the pandemic? Um, and then we can talk a little bit about just general things, you know, with the Columbus housing market and how it's 
continuing to constrain and what that's the impact that's having on your families as well. So definitely, Erin, the pandemic changed the whole face of homelessness. Um, you know, with the requirements and the guidance around uh, COVID and distancing and, you know, so we had to address those things. Um, what it did shine a light on is uh, that we needed to bridge the technology divide that we had within the shelter. You know, children weren't going to school. They needed access to technology. So we were able to um, expand our bandwidth and allow families to have their own access to technology in their rooms where their children would be able to attend school and, and get what they needed. Um, we, uh, of course, we had to change a lot of our processes and just to assist our families, you know, and keep them safe, staff and families safe. But as far as what we truly, truly wanted to impact was a, the ability to assist our families in accessing services and resources, because it takes a community to help a family get to their next step. So how do we do that? We connect them with our advocates. We worked with them on technology. We've done major capital improvements within, our, within the shelter so that everybody remains safe. So, you know, the delivery of services and how families in, access those services are the main ones. But barriers, it showed us a lot of barriers so not just technology, but simple documentation. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the documentation for anything, you, you're not going to get housing without documentation. You're not going to be able to even receive a job without documentation. That's the first things that they need. So if an agency is closed, how, do, how does our family access documents? Um, so, the, you know, those are some of the things that our families are having barriers with. Mm -hmm. And then that opportunity to, to bring those families um, from your facility and, and into permanent housing and, and understanding as we grow as a population in central Ohio and we continue to not build enough um, across the region to keep up with, with the pace of housing, you know, certainly the pandemic was was one way in which I think um, your families were impacted. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, as we see the housing market changing in Central Ohio, how that has impacted the families you serve? Oh, definitely. Um, so the housing market has changed here drastically. Um, the lack of affordable homes impacts our family, considering in 2020, our average earner that came in with earned income made $8.90. So that's a far cry from the uh, income that they would need to be able to pay three times the rent to even qualify. So now we're seeing where landlords aren't accepting third-party payments from other agencies. And also our families are being screened out by credit they're being screened out because although you might not be able to see past evictions from, uh, you can, landlords can go and see three years in the court, but on their FABCO report, it shows all of their evictions. So, I mean, there's just plenty of work that needs to be done. And family size, I have seen an increase in family size. At one time, we had three families in shelter that were families of 11. So trying to place a family of 11 in this county that's affordable is very difficult. Well, that's great uh, information and, and appreciate you sharing kind of what you've experienced over the past couple of years. Um, is there, as you look at the family center and you look at the staff and the folks that are kind of on the front line mm -hmm. uh, with your families, how are they faring as we made it through the pandemic and, and continue to see that housing crunch? Are there impacts on your staff that you're seeing? 
Um, Aaron, thank you for asking about my staff. I like to always point out that I have the best, most dedicated staff in, in the world. Um, I have some staff that have been here for 30 years, 16 years, and they continue um, to come in through the doors every day to make sure that our families are served. But definitely there has been, um, of course, morale. You know, when you come in and you're fighting a, an unknown pandemic and you're leaving your family to come and make sure that you can serve someone else's family, it wears on you. So, you know, at the Y, we've been doing all we can to make sure that our staff knows that they're safe, knows that we care, um, understands that this is what we're here to do. So we do employment assistance programs. So if, you, if our employees have things that they need to talk about outside of what we do, you know, you have your own personal place where you can go outside of work. Um, we try to make sure that we engage them and, and be open and say, hey, what is it that we can do to help you stay in the fight? Um, but the staffing patterns, it's, it's difficult right now. A lot of people are not applying for jobs. For a nonprofit, it's hard to stay competitive in the, uh, this market right now, you know, some, some people can make more money working at McDonald's than they can working with a population that requires so much, you know, working with a vulnerable population that require that you give your heart, your soul, your passion, and yourself to them every day. So. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, the opportunity to understand too, from the staff perspective and the folks that are serving in these roles. Um, I think is a really important part that we don't often talk about enough. And I think um, appreciate all of that information and, and transitioning a little bit over to Carly Booz and the work that she's doing with the Affordable um, Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. Um, so Carly, can you talk a little bit about the organization that you work with and, and the role you guys have in the, in the community? Absolutely. And thanks for the chance to be here. Thank you, Sonia, for kind of starting us off with, I think, a really great scene setting of what the challenges are. Um, so the Affordable Housing Alliance, we're a nonprofit organization. We're also a membership group. Um, and our goal is to cut the affordable housing gap in half by 2027, uh, Central Ohio. An entirely feasible um, objective, I should know. You know, before the pandemic hit, we were on track to do that. It is still within reach. Uh, so I am I am the opportunist in every room I go into, uh, and I am I am confident that we will get there. Uh, our members are housing professionals from kind of all walks of the housing life. I'm in super good company today. Uh, YWCA, Homes in the Hill, and the United Way are all uh, part of the alliance. But we're really intentional about having that kind of diversity of perspective. We want folks who have single family home ownership experience like Mark. We want Sonia and people who work in the homeless system and know what those challenges look like. So that way, as we are working with the community to create solutions, we know what that whole lifeline looks like. We know how it's gonna impact every aspect of our economy and we've planned for it and we've prepared for it. Um, the work, kind of what we do on the ground, we are first and foremost uh, advocates, right? I am confident that if I describe to you the problem, if I lay it out, if I provide you the facts, if I show the stories that all of these guys get to see every day, you will be compelled to act. Like this is too monumental of an issue for us not all want to dig in. It's just about how do we turn you on to it? How do we get that information into your hands? So we lead off with that education. But we are also incredibly fortunate in Central Ohio that the Alliance can provide hyper-local data. Uh, I think that our ability to explain what's happening on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis and to have kind of that top caliber research is something that only folks like New York and Los Angeles have. We're punching well above our weight class, but that's important because if we do want answers, we need to know exactly what the problem is and the data defines that. Um, we also really, really enjoy uh, problem solving, right? So like project design and development. Like if you've got a challenge and you don't know where to go, call us and we will put together the funnest table in the whole room and start figuring it out together. Uh, so yeah, long, long winded. I apologize, it's a trait of mine, but the Alliance is a very exciting organization. 
No, appreciate that. And I think um, kind of piggybacking on, on what Sonia talked about and thinking about the fact that I think we all hope um, that, you know, the experience we had at the height of the pandemic results in, in some uh, ability to move forward with a, a little bit more information, a little bit more understanding of where our vulnerabilities are. Um, and Sonia talked a little bit about her families and the impacts that they experience. And I know, Carly, in your work, um, you know, everyone was an all hands on deck situation. And I know your member organizations, especially, but are there things that came to light in that pandemic process um, that you feel like we need to think uh, more deeply about moving forward and, and really keep it in front of mind? Sure. I, and I think that, I think that unfortunately the pandemic was confirmation of what a lot of folks have been saying for some time, right? Like we know that there's only 32 affordable homes in Franklin County for every 100 families who need it. So we're, we're running, you know, one to three short of where we need to be. And we have 54,000 folks who are paying more than half their income towards housing, right? And like, if you're paying more than a third, your cost burden, red zone, you're paying more than half. That is life and death decisions on a daily. Like you are choosing housing or insulin. You are choosing whether to cook a healthy meal for your kid or to pull another shift to cover the mortgage. Like, and there's 54,000 of us there. And I think before the pandemic, everybody, uh, you know, was saying if the ground shakes. You've got 54,000 folks who are sitting on a cliff and they're, they're going to fall off. Well, COVID was the ground shake, right? Um, so in part, it was confirmation of what we were afraid of. But on the other hand, we've also learned so many fabulous lessons. Like we've learned that housing isn't just an abstract concept that maybe it will solve the problems. It absolutely does. When we infused rent relief into central Ohio, we pulled so many families back from the brink. We've now served over 18,000 households and helped them avoid eviction through the emergency rent assistance programs and the work that both Chilton and Impact are doing. Like this is proof of concept territory. We just now need to find out how we copy and paste this in a post pandemic world. I think one of the, the things with the Alliance, um, you know, as we looked at standing up programs really quickly, right? And, and taking infrastructure that was built to allocate funding at a, at a relatively modest level and ask them to really buckle down and uh, absorb a really significant need for the families. Can you talk a little bit about Rental 614? and the opportunity to, to get some word out about this, this information? Yes, so everybody get your notebooks out, right? Like this is the time to take down, take down uh, a web address in particular. Uh, we have just launched in a wonderful partnership with the city of Columbus who really spearhead this project. They articulated the need, they were the motivation to get it done, uh, as well as the city of, uh, I'm sorry, city of Columbus, Franklin County, uh, the United Way of Central Ohio and the Seamer Institute. It's rentful614.com. Kind of like hopeful, but rentful, hopeful614.com. We have the resources right now in a way that we have never had in any of our lifetimes to stop eviction. We have tens of millions of dollars that is sitting here in bank accounts in Central Ohio just for the purposes of getting tenants the rent they need and getting landlords the receivables they need. This is a landlord and tenant program. But we know from national level research that awareness of this is way, way too low. I mean, here we are, what, 12 months into a rent assistance programming, only half of tenants even know that it exists, let alone have gone and hit submit, have gone and submitted an application. They don't even have it on their radar yet. What Rentful is designed to do is to blast that message out as far and as wide as possible. We want everybody who pays rent to know that this is there. We also want people to be informed consumers, right? You need to know exactly what documents do I need to bring into my meeting so that I can get a check cut the next day. And if you have access to that information, we're transparent in the policies that apply to these programs, everybody's gonna be happier. One of the things that I am, I'm super proud to kind of partner with the city on, in fact, there's zero reason for me to be taking any credit here. One of the things that I am proud that the city of Columbus has done all by their lonesome uh, and is wonderful and not every city in the country has done this, has been really intentional about creating culturally competent rent assistance providers, folks who speak a variety of languages and can connect with tenants no matter where they're coming from, folks who are able to walk in different spaces than I can and have authentic relationships with the community and getting resources to them so that they can help the folks that they already have connections with. That is wonderful. 
but we've got about 20, 25, 30 groups that are now administering run assistance. It can get really confusing. Just like, where do I start, right? Like, where do I go? Where is step A1? Renful has all of those providers listed. It shows you what they specialize in. Um, importantly, it shows you uh, what other services they provide. So me struggling to pay rent might look different than Mark struggling to pay rent, might look different than Sonia. Maybe my job, my problem is that I lost my job. Maybe someone else's problem is that they become disabled and they're not going to work anymore. I need rent assistance. Mark needs rent assistance, but I also need uh, workforce housing. Uh, I also need workforce development. I also need resume building. What Mark would need is budget counseling. He needs someone to help me reset the status quo and figure out where to go next. Renful's the one-stop shop for all of that. Um, it needs to get out. We need more work. So please write it down, share it with your networks. I will make you guys graphics. I will co-brand social media for you. Like we just need to get that word out because it's it's wonderful. Great. Um, yeah, and thinking about those opportunities that have presented themselves as we've had to stand up these programs. But the question I, I asked Sonia, just relative to the changes in the housing market in Central Ohio, and, and I think We've all seen the 2020 census data and no surprise, a lot of folks are choosing to move to, to the Columbus region, which is great. Um, but we certainly um, see the, the possibility of a future where we, we really lack any affordability if, if we're not making changes to the systems that we have in place. And I know Carly, you're on the front lines of having those conversations across a lot of different folks from the development community to folks like the city of Columbus. What is on your list of, of really important things that we need to be thinking about in the next few years to position ourselves to be uh, continue to be an affordable region? Yeah, um, so I think my, my first instinct to answer that is to say that our crisis is beyond silver bullet range, right? Like there is no single solution that is going to be able to pull us back from this break anymore. But we live in a community where our policymakers, our elected officials completely get it. They know what they're up against and they're looking at it from so many different perspectives, right? We are where we're supposed to be. I was just on a call this morning where I heard again that the mayor considers affordable housing to be one of his top three priorities. That all by itself is an asset that is phenomenal. It is more than I think any other city across the state is able to do right now. So when you talk about all those different rooms that this conversation is happening in, there's exciting things. Right now, the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, how uh, residential abatement policy is implemented is something that is being modified to expand affordability. That's a tool. We don't know exactly how that policy is going to finish because it's under community consideration now, but keeping that on the radar is important. Looking at our zoning code and whether we are building homes that meet the 21st century demand or whether we're still in the 1950s mentality of when that code was originally created. Um, one of the things that I am particularly excited in uh, for, and one of the things the Alliance has been a really strong champion of is looking at our federal stimulus dollars and having a concrete plan for what that means for affordability. And a little bit of background on that. We know from every other economic downturn in American history, that housing is our path out. You put investments into housing, you're hiring a local contractor who's hiring local subcontractors, so you've got jobs. They are buying local materials, so you've got a solid supply chain that is investing that money locally. You are creating a product that stays right here in Central Ohio. It doesn't get shipped to Texas or to California or to India. And that product pays taxes for ever and ever and ever. Like you're just taking an infusion of money and keeping it local, keeping that bubble on it and keeping all of those resources here. And from the Great Depression to the SNL crash to the Great Recession, housing has always been the thing that picked the economy up and got it running again. We can do that for COVID, right? What the Alliance has recommended is that, and Mark, you're gonna appreciate this, right? This is Housing Counselor 101. You've got a client in front of you. The first thing you say is you should be spending 30% of your income on housing. That is an investment in you. That is an investment in your future. That is a healthy and sustainable space to be. We think that we can apply that same principle to these relief dollars. If we commit 30% of these hyper-flexible, locally controlled dollars into housing projects, things like building for our housing need, building for the next decade, uh, investing in homeowners, right? 
making sure that if you are a homeowner who needs a critical repair, that you've got access to the funds to do that. Um, and looking at economic mobility. How are we using housing as a base to get people better paying jobs so they don't need affordable housing? We put 30% of these resources to those problems. We're gonna lick this recession in no time. We are gonna have the most sustainable, most equitable recovery in America. Thanks, Carly. I really appreciate it. And uh, want to transition over to our third panelist. Uh, Mark, can you talk a little bit about your role and, and the work of Homes on the Hill and in, in housing in Central Ohio? Sure. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I just want to quickly say uh, it's wonderful that two leaders like Sonia and Carly are perfectly positioned at their organizations and they bring some incredible energy. you I could just listen to you two. If, if I could cede my time, I, I would, but uh, you, you guys are great. Uh, yeah, Homes on the Hill, we are a community development a nonprofit here on the western part of the county, and uh, we're a, a United Way supported organization, so we certainly, uh, you know, on a daily basis, all of the individuals that we engage with who are seeking uh, any of our services. Um, we, we don't exist without our partners and uh, United Way is uh, a very important uh, to us. So yeah, we, we kind of do two things. Uh, we, we do housing development here uh, geographically on the western side of the county and um, uh, try and um, not only rehabilitate uh, existing uh, property, but also uh, we've had a unique opportunity to build some smaller footprinted homes uh, to keep those sales prices affordable for individuals uh, who uh, are seeking to become homeowners. And uh, they, they would also have to be individuals at 80% and below the area median income to, to purchase our home. So we have wonderful support from the city and the county commissioners. I uh, just want to echo, uh, again, a point Carly made. Uh, we do live in a region where, and I'm born and raised in central Ohio, but uh, our, our leadership absolutely gets it and it is very supportive from uh, city council to the county commissioner. So again, we're, we're well supported in our uh, housing development side of things. The other half of what we do, and primarily the side that I'm on, is uh, our, our housing counseling. Uh, we are a HUD-approved housing counseling agency. Uh, we conduct home buyer workshops uh, for first-time home buyers to really give them uh, a lot of answers on what are my steps to engage with becoming a, a path to becoming a homeowner? And, uh, you know, what are some of the myths out there that, uh, you know, I need 20% down or, um, you know, I have to make, uh, you know, a certain amount of money uh, to, to buy a house. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we engage with uh, not only on, on the pre-purchase side, but post-purchase with people who uh, are facing foreclosure I have uh, mortgage delinquency, uh, existing homeowners. And then, of course, uh, in the last year, as Carly mentioned, uh, the two uh, kind of emergency rental uh, opportunities for tenants and landlords. We've helped process uh, applications for people with uh, dollars from impact to keep them in their units. And also here uh, very recently, uh, the city uh, stable housing initiative or um, uh, the, the city ERA program as it's known. And so that is, I think, uh, you know, going to continue to grow uh, as was mentioned, you know, some more marketing is done. There are about 27 agencies like ours that are helping uh, people to remain in their units. And uh, we are seeing that that's getting, uh, you know, a, a little busier as, as time is going on. I'm sure I've missed something that we do, but th those are kind of the, the big, the big things. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And I think um, thinking about how important wealth building is for families and, you know, uh, 
a unit that's owned by a homeowner, you know, maintains its affordability because, you know, it's not subject to rent increases and it really gives stability to families uh, and communities. But I don't think you can turn on any sort of media without hearing uh, tales of how crazy the housing buying market is. Uh, especially in central Ohio. So Mark, I was just wondering in your work over the last few years, the challenges uh, that you've seen change or if certain things have just gotten exacerbated as we've uh, seen the price of homes tick up in central Ohio. Yeah, I, I walk a fine line of uh, being, um, uh, trying to be a glass half full with a first time home buyer who's looking to purchase a home in Franklin County and then uh, being realistic. You know, it's my job to help really prepare you uh, for that journey. Um, I I worked with people for maybe a year where we've worked on building their credit and doing some budget analysis, getting them to a point where they could sustain uh, maybe a payment a little higher than what they're paying in rent right now. And then when we flip that coin to the other side, the other half of the battle is, okay, I, I have to realistically tell you, you are you know, really going into a battle, especially here in 2021. Uh, in October of 2020, 21% of the homes uh, through October 2020 sold above the list price. Through October, uh, we just got these numbers, uh, through October of 2021, of all of the homes that went into contract in central Ohio sold above their list price. So it's real important to have a realtor who is uh, experienced and can navigate in some neighborhoods for you as a first time home buyer. Uh, That to me has been kind of the, the biggest change is really to know uh, that I, I need help. I can't buy a home without a realtor who can uh, really identify in a neighborhood, hey, this is a house that maybe we can't spend a lot of time on because more than likely, you know, it, it's going to go over sales price so much. It's not within your pre-qualification range. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they, they can really benefit from a realtor who can say, here are two or three homes that we really need to concentrate on. I think we have a really good chance of having our contract accepted. So um, it's that other half of the coin that is is certainly the battle. We can get them coached up and we can get them Uh, pre-qualified. It is that battle for, uh, you know, finding a home that, that, you know, meets their needs and, and they can afford. I know part of your work, as, as you mentioned, is really getting folks ready uh, for home ownership and, and what that means in terms of uh, the financing component of it and uh-huh. qualifying for loans. And, you know, are there um, typical things that you see facing folks that are, are looking to qualify for a loan? Are there um, programs that you feel like are really especially helpful in bridging some of those gaps those families might have in, in terms of getting ready for home ownership? Oh, uh, absolutely. Again, we can talk partners uh, here in Central Ohio. You're looking at City of Columbus uh, Development Department that uh, operates the uh, ADDI American Dream Down Payment Initiative, a wonderful uh, (laughs) down payment source for um, uh, potential homeowners. Uh, Homeport, another uh, HUD approved housing counseling agency operates the county's uh, Franklin County down payment assistance grant. Uh, Isabel Giles does a wonderful job there helping shepherd people through uh, that. that. That's uh, for properties that uh, you know wouldn't start with a 010 parcel number. They are uh, within the county. Uh, And then you're looking at, um, you know, we have a tremendous partner in Ohio Housing Finance Agency. They have uh, their down payment uh, assistance program that can offer 5% of the purchase price. They have more liberal income uh, guidelines that allow households of one or two people that may earn a little bit more, but still need really that down payment assistance money that, that really helps them you know, fight, uh, you know, within, um, 
a, a situation where they're competing with so many other offers, they know, hey, if I have to overbid on a property, uh, I, I can do it. And, and you know, it, it helps my family when we're uh, trying to have a seller, uh, you know, take our, our bid. So I hope that answers your question. But again, uh, more partners that are available, the down payment assistance uh, programs are strong here, as well as uh, the lenders uh, also have their own uh, kind of first time home buyer mortgages where, <clears throat> excuse me, they're able to um, offer some uh, direct assistance at closing for them. So, so I, I hope I didn't uh, misremember anyone out there that is doing great work, but um, th those are the ones that I uh, engage with most often. I'm seeing a couple questions come through on the chat, but I, I kind of can't help myself, Mark, and I, I'm going to delve into the question of, you know, thinking about home ownership differently. And if you can just um, talk a little bit about the land trust and the opportunities that that some of these alternative structures to home ownership offer families in Central Ohio. Yeah, the land trust is a uh, it's not a new concept, but it's uh, new, relatively new here to Central Ohio, and that is. Uh, uh, it, it's primarily run by, um, throw an acronym at you, COCLT, Central Ohio Community Land Trust. And Norman Dina and Lynn Tellerico at the Land Trust do a wonderful job. Last year, they built and sold, uh, I believe, 42 homes in certain geographic areas, neighborhoods where uh, they want to, you know, help put some control on the spiraling uh, sales prices that, uh, that they're obviously seeing. They have an ability to uh, build new homes on lots that the county and city have, have taken back. And uh, they, they're looking to uh, do that in uh, Urban Crest and Whitehall are two areas that they're looking to uh, build in to focus in in 2022 primarily, but a land trust is where you still um, you you purchase the home, not necessarily the land. The land trust would continue to own the parcel. You obtain a mortgage to to buy the home, and uh, there's a considerable amount of subsidy that is also. Uh, placed in to, to buy a brand new home within the county uh, that can be affordable for your household. There are some income limitations as far as how much a household can earn or, or cannot go over. But at the end, when you go to sell the home, you share in the equity that has built up uh, in the home with the land trust. And, and the land trust kind of takes it back over from you and, and sells it again to uh, the, the next homeowner. Again, trying to keep uh, some uh, control or, or, or quite a bit of, of control on future sales prices. And again, this uh, uh, affordability slash uh, dramatic increase in, in property values. That's that. I'm just skimming the high point on that. They they have some great uh, uh, great classes uh, that the land trust uh, produces. So if if anyone is interested, uh, seek them out, and that would be your very first step. Well, that's that's great information, especially on the the wealth building side and making sure that those opportunities remain uh, at all income levels. So I appreciate that. Um, I've been looking at the chat and we do have a couple questions uh, for the group. So Michael Wilkos asked a question, I think Carly, you briefly mentioned it, but the city of Columbus is, is undertaking um, for the first time in 70 years, an update of the zoning code uh, and really taking a comprehensive look at how to create um, a framework for 21st century needs and, and especially around housing. And I think, we've all had a lot of conversations the last couple of years about the negative impacts of zoning. And I think there's some opportunities to be looking at the code um, in, in this time. And so I wondered if the three of you could just talk a little bit about uh, what you would see as the opportunities for a, a zoning code rewrite for Columbus specifically. 
I mean, I'm happy to lead off because I agree that this is an exciting opportunity. And I think that what you said is important to anchor, right? This code was developed in the 1950s. Think about what our housing policy was in the 1950s. Suburbanization, right? We want to be as far away from downtown as possible. We want to be as spread out from other people as possible. I love my big ass Cadillac. I want to drive it mentality. Um, think also about what our social policy was in the 50s. Think about what our racial equity policy was in the 50s. That code has been tweaked and adjusted, but those bones are still in there. So this is the right time to look at that. One of the things that I think about when I think about zoning is that right now we just can't afford to build affordably, right? That the code and various regulations makes that price point go up and up and up until even if you want to put something in the ground and you want to create affordable housing, you no longer can do it. We have setback requirements. We have side yard requirements. We have parking requirements that don't match what people's car ownership habits are. And all of these just makes it more and more expensive. And I, there's, I think it's Columbus Underground that does an annual survey of like, what is your favorite neighborhood? And always every year, it's like German Village, Clintonville, Neary's Brewery, like all of those neighborhoods are illegal to build today. Couldn't do it. Like I could not recreate a German Village if I wanted to, because it is against the law to build that kind of housing, even though that is what everybody is saying is their favorite neighborhood, where they want to live. So we've got this consumer uh, demand and supply mismatch. Because of that, you see costs increase and affordability decrease as a procedural result, right? Because if I'm a developer and I wanna build a house that meets what my buyer is asking for, I have to get 15 variances from the code to do that. To get a variance, I gotta hire a lawyer. I gotta hire an engineer. I gotta hire an architect. I gotta hire a PR firm sometimes. You know, you have to, it's this professionalization. So if I'm just a guy with a lot and an idea, it becomes unduly expensive and uh, I, it's very unlikely that I would be able to put an idea into the ground. And that is a result of the code. That is a result of the processes that we put in place that we can change. Um, if I can do one more note, because I think it's hard to have a zoning conversation without mentioning NIMBY as well. And the fact that there are voices that are afraid of change. And that's a fear that we got to lead into. You can't dismiss that, right? You need to listen to why people are concerned, but we also need to come armed with the facts and be able to lean into what research tells us and what studies show us. And we know, for instance, that building affordable housing does not decrease in any way, shape, or form the value of the homes that are surrounding it. In fact, you see an aggregate increase in surrounding land value by building affordable housing. That's a fact that we need to get out there. Same for school quality. You build affordable housing in a community, schools tend to do better because you have a more diverse student body that is more representative of the real world and it's just better for the whole community. So I, I think that this is very cool work um, and we are all in for it. Appreciate it. Mark or Sonia? Carly, well, I oh, go ahead, Sonia, please. Um, I, I would just like to piggyback off of that because it is true. Um, we know there's been practices of redlining neighborhoods and, you know, it's not inclusive. Um, education and access to wealth are, you know, paramount to what we need to do to assist our families from moving from poverty or renting to owning. When you own land, that's powerful. So when our children are able to go to different school districts and access a better education, that's key. So when you invest at a basic level, then you reap the returns. So it's important. The zoning is important to how we can move past the homelessness issue and, and move into accessing wealth, accessing education. And when you invest in your community, the return is unfathomable. So I was just gonna say, you know, we have a real life example of kind of what we're talking about, which is um, repurposing the old defunct and kind of uh, 
eyesore Al Rosa Villa property. And no sooner had shovels kind of turned dirt and announced the, uh, the great plans for quite a few affordable housing units there that within 24 hours, I'm seeing articles, Google news feeds and, uh, you know, uh, uh, channel six, uh, 10 for, you know, follow-ups on, Hey, oh, there are people who are, uh, you know, uh, against and, and starting to raise concerns about, you know, an affordable housing development on Sinclair road in the middle of, uh, you know, quite a bit of, of commercial area. And so whatever changes needed to, to be made for that to happen, that is great. But as Carly mentioned, voices need to come together to bring a lot of facts about, you know, what that could mean for the area uh, and dispel rumors and myths. And that, that's the heart, that's the fight uh, it is just, okay, now we've got to get voices like Carly and Sonia back on the news so they can combat some of this early negativity to uh, what could potentially be and will be, uh, you know, a, a great project. But imagine continuing to expand that kind of work and, and the pushback, the NIMBY, um, as Carly mentioned, that's Whew, that's that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, Carly. Be ready, girl. I remember going to shows at Al Rosa. I come I come ready for that. There you go. No, appreciate all of that, and and certainly a, a really important part of the conversation moving forward, and and how we grow as a community, um, not just within the city of Columbus, but the entirety of of the Franklin County region, and and understanding how we all work together. Um, we have a question about access and affordability of housing in Columbus compared to other parts of the country. And I think that's a conversation um, I'm reading between the lines a little bit that, that we have in Columbus where there is some relative affordability uh, compared to where we see price points in other communities. Um, but we are kind of at the, at the front edge of, of where we see that changing. And so I don't know if folks have um, some input about kind of where we are compared to other parts of the country and, and what that means for, for Central Ohio in terms of affordability moving forward. I'm a little bit of a housing nerd in that I've signed up for every uh, article that's out there and, and I try and read uh, some of them in my spare time. Uh, and what, what I'm seeing right now are articles that uh, you're absolutely right, Aaron. Comparatively, in the Midwest, we are one of the most affordable areas, comparing that to, uh, you know, especially places like Chicago uh, and, and certainly Nashville, if, if you want to think of that as, uh, as an area that uh, is Midwestern. So even at a median sales price of 280, 284,000 right now, uh, single family, uh, we, we are still well below. That, that, that it doesn't salve the, you know, the mindset of what we're dealing with here because so many families remember Columbus as you know, 1995 Columbus when, oh, my mom and dad bought this there for this much. And I, you know, I, I can't believe we're, we're here. So yes, if you take a moment, take a step back, we are still uh, relatively one of the most affordable areas in the Midwest and the central part of the U.S. Um, and, and it is continuing to draw People, we get calls here at our agency every day from people moving from all over the United States saying, hey, you know, where, where's a good place to live? Where can I find a, a place to rent? I mean, I would expand on that too, that the Alliance's focus isn't on kind of the general uh, housing stock in Central Ohio. We focus on those who are most vulnerable and whether they have access. And until that 54,000 households who are cost burdened shrinks to zero, We've got more work to do. And I can champion the work that the city of Columbus has done, the work that the Franklin County Board of Commissioners has done. And I can be proud of that all day, every day. But I also know that I'm shooting to put myself out of business. And I, I will be the loud mouth until we hit that, that goal, right? Um, 
I also, and this is again, kind of the alliance's aura in this space, but we think about this from an economic development perspective. And we're not just shooting for status quo either. We want Columbus to continue to be a growing, dynamic, energetic city. To do that, we need to continue to recruit employers and job creators. And one of the first things that any one of those guys is going to ask is, where will I put my body? Where will I put my staff? Where will my employees live? And that really is a suburban question. That is not something that the city can shoulder on their own. We need all of our suburbs to look at how am I doing economic development work that is holistic, that is looking at the housing needs of the people who will live there. Um, we just released a, a research report uh, in the last month that, that honed in on this. And it was 80%, 80% of the employers that we surveyed said that housing is affecting their employees. When they walk in and sit down at their desk, their housing is on their mind. And if they're struggling with their housing, they're not as productive as employees. So it, it's a business decision. And that's so true, Carly. That really is that it's when you do have employees that are at a benefits cliff where they really can't afford afford to lose maybe benefits that they already have and they're thinking about their housing and some of our um some of my employees I can't speak for anybody else but they think of, they worry about being homeless just like the people that they're serving so when you how do you come in every day with that burden on your heart and in your mind, but still give all that you have to a family that's in the same situation. You know, me, myself, personally, you know, I'm a single mother. I work two jobs. I try to, to try to stay above that. You know, you miss a paycheck or two. I don't have three years of savings to, in an account to where I have that net. So realistically speaking, and if you think that the average income of our families coming in, earned income was $8.90 an hour, what is truly affordable? And if it's affordable, do I really want to live in that area? I can't imagine the YWCA's experience is unique in that, in, in what your staff is trying to deal with right now, today. 25% of Ohioans don't know how they're going to pay next month's rent. If you are there, one in four of them do not know where they're going to get the funds for that. How many renters work in your organization? Statistically speaking, you know people who are struggling with this. And of course, that's going to affect morale, productivity, engagement, uh, access up the job letter and mobility. Yeah. Yes, it does. I think we're, we're getting close to the hour, but I, a question came in from Desiree uh, that I think would be a nice way to cap off this conversation. And she asked how individuals can get involved to help the housing situation in Central Ohio. So I'd be interested from the three of you of how, how folks can really uh, be part of this conversation moving forward. Um, I'll go ahead and speak. I mean, there's so many different levels of help that you can, you know, when you're trying to move the bar. You know, I always speak up, um, even have those hard conversations. But a lot of times I feel like we have these town halls and we have conversations and, and we have all these great ideas, but then there's the lack of inaction, you know, uh, especially, I'm not going to say with the homeless population, but there's more of a blinder where if I don't look, if I don't see, well, you know, it really is here. So if you volunteer your time, if you go to the, your local um, council meetings and say, hey, what are we doing? Our, what is our zoning? How are our COVID affecting what we can do? Um, understand that there, there's hunger. Understand that, you know, we have to invest in, we need to work ourselves out of our positions. You know, we need to invest in the community. Like, let's push the entitlement programs and say, hey, look, instead of when a family receives benefits and they finally get to where they need to be, then you cut everything from them. So then you're throwing them right back into poverty, which is a whole cycle. So instead of our system being so punitive, let's be a, a system that 
rewards that keeps you at that level. Because what a lot of people don't understand is when I go from making $8.90 an hour to making $16 an hour, then my rent is going to go up. If, it, if it's low income, my child care is going to go up. I'm going to lose my food stamps. So therefore, I'm worse off. You know, so you know, that's me. No, that was that was wonderful. Uh, Carly or, or Mark, do you have some ways folks can get engaged in this housing conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for my piece, and I'll let Mark finish this off strong, so yes, engage, talk about it, make your voice heard. And there are so many forms in which to do that. We talked about ARPA. We talked about that 30% in our future. You can, you know, call elected officials and say that that's something you support. The city of Whitehall right now is considering a source of income ordinance. It is entirely legal in Whitehall for a landlord to say, I'm not going to rent to you because you receive child support. Entirely legal. There's a law that is working its way through the process that would prevent that. And they're seeking public comment. And right now, you know, the strongest voices are gonna be the landlords who don't know how the law works, who are concerned about it. Let's get public comment that has a much broader perspective that is representative of not just the, the owners and the operators, but also the tenants and the rent uh, and the folks that we serve. Um, and I, I can't go by another two seconds without saying rentful, 614.com. Like, we're coming into the holiday season. You've got that cousin who's going to, you know, overindulge on the Yuletide, talk about how they're having trouble paying their bills. We've got tips on the website for navigating those hard conversations with family and friends. How do you, how do you approach somebody who's struggling in a way that is respectful um, and that is, you know, as comfortable as you can and get them in the help they need. Uh, so please go to that site and, and help us spread that word. Uh, hard to follow up again, Sonia and Carly. I find myself at a loss uh, after they put things out there because they are uh, really, really strong. I just, uh, you know, if, if, if you are blessed and you're living above the bar in Central Ohio, don't forget about people who are below the bar. Uh, give through your United Way campaign give directly to the why, um, volunteer if you can at, at organizations like ours. We'll, we'll take a few hours from you. Um, but uh, just, yeah, be, be mindful uh, of the very prosperous area that we live in. If you are blessed to not ignore uh, things and, and want to uh, you know, help, help those around you. So giving to housing, homelessness, and hunger are three huge, huge things that you can do. I, I can't tell you, all three of you, how wonderful this conversation's been. And uh, just really appreciate all the work that you guys do um, for families in Central Ohio and, and continue to participate with us in the, in the conversation at, at the strategic level as well. So this was a, a joy for me, and I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Mr. Ryerson with United Way. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, this was a great discussion. I'm not surprised at all because this is an amazing panel. Special thanks again to Sonia, Carly, and Mark. Um, we are at our time, but I just want to kind of bring us to a close remind everybody um, as a trusted partner in Central Ohio for almost 100 years, United Way is committed to working side by side with community partners such as the ones on the panel today towards a better tomorrow. We bring together donors, volunteers, advocates, nonprofits, leaders, and more to take on Central Ohio's toughest challenges like housing and homelessness because our community is stronger when we show up united. So please, uh, check out the chat. There's a recording of today's session, as well as the helpful resources that we talked about, including Rentful and some other research studies that we referenced, as well as all of the previous Learn United conversations that happened this season. They get, all can be found on our website. Please follow those links. Please reach out to me or any one of us at United Way if you have any more questions. Um, and thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, this engagement session and uh, early happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.